I wonder if you could address, you know, your protocol, which, uh, you know, the, the keto flex protocol, where yeah. we can get and how we can get into ketosis just naturally. Um, yeah. and then where, you know, exogenous ketones might be, uh, might be useful. Yeah. Such a good point. Uh, and, and, and again, fascinating biochemistry. So, and yeah. I should, I, I, I want to thank, um, the, uh, uh, Nutrition for Longevity. This is a group that was uh, founded by Walter Longo, um, uh, for essentially doing things that are good for you, uh, for your longevity, for your cardiovascular health, for cancer, uh, and now for Alzheimer's, um, with different diets. And so they have now worked with us to come up with a keto flex 12-3, which is what we call this, uh, which is an optimal diet for your synapses. Uh, and um, you can now get this directly. Uh, you can literally look at KetoFlex123 uh, on your computer and, and pull that up. So it's, it's easy to get it delivered, easy to, to, to get yourself into ketosis. So here's the thing. Your brain, as you indicated, you've got to have one of two energy sources. And in a perfect world, you're going back and forth and you're using both these. One is glucose, mm -hmm. one is ketones. The people that I see who are having problem with cognition have lost both. So when I see someone mm. with cognitive decline, this is an energetic emergency. They are literally hitting on one or two cylinders. They're not, they've not got the energetics that they need. And the reason for that is they've developed the insulin resistance that I mentioned earlier. And by the way, this is what PET scans show. If the signature of Alzheimer's and pre-Alzheimer's on a PET scan is reduced glucose utilization in the temporal lobe and the parietal lobe. There mm -hmm. it is. You can actually see it on a scan. And so you've lost that metabolically because you have been flooding the system with fructose or with, or, or with high amounts of simple carbs. Unfortunately, because your body's been responding by putting out more insulin, that prevents you from making ketones. You can't make ketones as long as your insulin is high. And so you've lost both and you're literally just limping along and your brain is now degenerating. So in a perfect world, yes, you would restore insulin sensitivity and you'd restore the ability to make ketones. But because this is an emergency, I always recommend to people, just give some exogenous ketones. After a couple of months, you can get into endogenous ketosis and that's even better. But for a lot of people, they are frail. They don't have the fat to burn or they don't have the time to, to wait. Get them some energy first. And then oh, what we'll do is we'll get you to be insulin sensitive. We're gonna have to put you on a low carb diet. So what we use, which is called KetoFlex 12 slash three, is plant rich, it doesn't have to be all plants. Have some wild, you know, have some wild caught fish, hopefully low mercury fish, just like the smash fish. Uh, have some, uh, you know, have some grass fed beef, have some pastured chicken. Great. But it's going to be plant rich, mildly ketogenic. So you're going to have high phytonutrients. You're going to have high fiber and people underestimate how important uh, you know, prebiotic fiber is, uh, the stuff, it, it improves your glycemic, uh, response. It improves your lipid profile. It helps you detox. I mean, it's amazing how, of course, it feeds your, your gut microbiome. It's amazing how important that is. And then you want to have 12 to 16 hours of fasting between finishing your dinner, starting your breakfast or brunch, which is why we call it KetoFlex 12-3. The three is for three hours before you go to bed, you don't want to be eating either because you don't want to be pushing your insulin high while you're sleeping. So right. KetoFlex 12-3 is the approach that has worked best for people who have cognitive decline. Now, some people argue, well, you know, just do a Mediterranean diet. Well, yeah, th that can help, but that doesn't get you to be metabolically flexible as well. And it doesn't get you into that ketosis. We want you to be able to do both. We want you to bring back your ability to use glucose and bring back your ability to make and use ketones. But again, if you're frail, just take some exogenous ketones. 
it's fine because one way or another you need to support the energetics of your brain the other thing of course that the diet does it's anti-inflammatory so you're now yeah. also dealing with the other half of the equation you're bringing down that inflammation now to be fair over time you need to know what was causing the inflammation if it's because you've got lyme disease you want to treat that if it's because right. you've got some other pathogen you want to treat that if it's leaky gut you want to treat that as well but you can buy yourself nine to twelve months uh, by just dealing with these basics so good so low glycemic plant focused i think you say like use meat as a condiment right um some health a, a good amount of healthy fats like yes. you can get in nuts and seeds and avocados and um and fatty fish um and uh and try to you know I, i'm on a 16-8 fasting protocol yeah, um i think that's better for people that have an apoe4 right. presentation um but at least 12 hours and really it's not that huge of a sacrifice <laughs> you know you finish you know you're eating dinner around 7 30 like you say take three hours if your bedtime's 10 30 you know you don't even if you eat at 7 30 the next morning you know that's not a huge sacrifice it's not that difficult to get into that kind of routine yeah. um but um but I, I think this is really really important i mean what you outline um is really first understanding the source of the insult getting at that changing your protocols to address that then removing and addressing plaques um and, and addressing amyloid so i wonder once you've been able to assess where the source of the problem is and then you go into that process of actually uh of removing amyloid it, w what is the best it, it, does that happen as a natural result of adopting the protocols or is that where there are some therapeutics that come into um that come into play yeah so so that is part of the protocol but think you have to think about this in different stages so to begin with you want to remove the source what is driving this to begin with and it's and it's multiple things yeah. you know it's your lifestyle and it's your sleep and it's your stress levels and by the way what is stress what does stress do it acts very much like saturated fat it puts your immune system on high alert so you want to bring that down as well it's actually quite an important part of this overall once you've gotten that to be improved you now also you want to optimize things and then you want to build back what's been lost it's a little bit like you know if you've had a heart attack and you've got uh, you've got clogged vessels you want to get rid of that clog and then but then you also want to strengthen your cardiovascular musculature so you we want to build back the synapses that have been lost and that th involves trophic support things like brain derived neurotrophic factor and appropriate hormones when, when needed uh, and uh, and appropriate nutrition uh, so these things are all critical and again the armamentarium you know has gotten bigger and bigger there are things like mm -hmm. intranasal trophic factors and peptides that can actually be you know useful used in the appropriate way at the appropriate time so over time what happens is you can slowly remove that amyloid but you have to remember the amyloid gets stored in these plaques the plaques themselves are not major problems they simply indicate you've mm. been making amyloid so there it's a good biomarker but the, the plaques aren't the problem the problem is the stuff that's when the plaques say ah okay there's a problem now i'm going to send out it's just like soldiers in a fort as long as they're in the fort, they're not going to be killing people. Now, when you've got some an invading organism, you open the doors and out come the soldiers and they start shooting and bombing and all that sort of stuff. So it's those oligomers. It's these are the small mm -hmm. groups of the amyloid molecules. They're the ones that kill the bacteria, but also unfortunately cause damage to the synapses, cause you now to, to pull back. And you again, you can follow this beautiful biochemistry. They cause your tau to be phosphorylated. Your tau is a molecule that sits on the microtubules and stabilizes them. So now you've got the ability to make 
and store new connections. If you want to pull that back because things are bad, uh oh, we're going to retreat. You simply phosphorylate your tau, it pops off, and now you collapse your neurite. Well, what do you see in Alzheimer's? Mm. A ton of phospho tau. And that's why yeah. the signals being sent out pull back, pull back. So what we're, we'd like to do is show that so your phospho tau is coming down, which is actually we're in the middle of doing that right now with the clinical trial we're doing. Uh, and so the idea then is the, it's not so much getting rid of the amyloid, it's getting rid of the bad amyloid. And there are things you can do. Curcumin is a good, uh, good way to do that. It has an anti-inflammatory effect, of course, but it also binds both to the, the amyloid and the tau, helps you to remove it. So that's a good way to go. Um, ashwagandha turns out to be helpful. Now, these things are slow removals over time. The most important thing is don't keep building it up. Don't keep exposing yourself to the stuff that's going to be, and slowly over time, it should improve. The idea of ripping it out, uh, you know, quickly and doing that as a monotherapy, it just makes absolutely no sense if you understand what this disease is. And so yeah. I, again, I, I believe that in the long run, what we'll be doing is using those drugs in, to begin with in micro doses, just to slowly, slowly remove this stuff over time. 